Church, greetings to you all. Um, and wherever you are watching this video from, may the peace of the Lord that surpasses all understanding be upon you. Um, I uh, want to welcome you to our first um, worship session of the year 2021. Um, and I want to say Happy New Year. Uh, 2020 has been a difficult year for most of us with so many ups and downs and highs and lows. Uh, but God carried us through it, and here we are um, with His grace in 2021. And that's because our God is able to uh, bring ruins to life and change ashes into beauty. Uh, it doesn't matter if we are down in the valleys or on a mountaintop or any point in between. He can use those circumstances and situations um, to bring us into the big picture that he has in mind for us, and that is to make us more look like his son, Jesus Christ. And that always uh, puts praises on our lips. That's uh, one of the things that we need to be always thankful for. Um, David says in Psalms 34, he says, I will exalt the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Uh, such a beautiful praise psalm. Uh, but when we see the context uh, in which David wrote this uh, psalm, we understand that it wasn't the best time of his life. He was uh, drove away by Abimelech and, um, you know, he felt betrayed and heartbroken. Yet he's saying, I will glory in the Lord and the praises will always be on my lips. And I think this this gives us a, a great lesson uh, Yes, life is difficult and difficult times always will come in life, but we can uh, overpass them and look at the person uh, who controls them, who has control over them. I, we can look at to God who has a, a plan uh, to use all circumstances to bring us into perfection. So um, uh, my wish and prayer for 2021 uh, for us is to be filled continuously with the praises of the Lord uh, in our lips and um, yeah to be filled with the joy that comes with it so let's let's pray briefly and we'll continue to worship dear Heavenly Father thank you so much for what you have done in 2020 in our lives even though there are um, so many odd things Lord you use them to create a character and uh, an image of your son in us. And we're glad and thankful for that. And you brought us to this new year. And Lord, I pray that in this new year, um, you will give us an opportunity and a chance to be more closer to you and open up a new realm and dimension uh, of a, a higher relationship with you. Yeah, and I pray that you will be together with us in our worship. You will be glorified in our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> You love is devoted Like a ring of solely gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of all You love is enduring Through the winter rain And beyond the horizon With mercy for today Faithful you have been, faithful you will be. You pray to serve to me, and it's why I sing your praise. Well, 
ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. You father the orphan Your kindness makes us whole You shoulder our weakness And your strength becomes our own You making me like you Causing me and why Bringing beauty from ashes For you will have your pride Free of all their gifts Read of all her shame, known by her to name, and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. You will be praised, you will be praised. With angels and saints, we sing worthy are you, Lord. You will be praised, you will be praised. Angels and saints, we sing worthy are you, Lord. You will be praised. You will be praised. With angels and saints, we sing worthy are you, Lord. You will be praised. You will be praised. With angels and saints, we are you Lord and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will Ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Ever be on my The grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. When I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. And 
was another in the fire standing next to me there was another in the waters holding back the seas should I ever need reminded of how I've been set free there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me there is another My dad left for dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore Should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning Either way I'm bound to the wings of this world And I know, and I know I will never be fire standing next to me there is another in the waters holding back the seas and should I ever need remind him what power set me free there is a breath that holds nobody now the power lives in me there is another in the fire Oh, 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 I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness falls to him, I can feel the roar in the heavens of the space between where I sit. I can feel the ground shaking needs us as the prison walls gave in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus Who he was is still is and will be through it all So come what may in this space between All the things I'm seeing and this reckoning And I know I will never be alone Come on! Woo! And I know I will never be alone There'll be another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding Could you be to me? I've got a joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you be I can see the light in the darkness At the darkness falls to him I can hear the roar in the heavens At the space between where I sing I can feel the ground shook beneath us At the prison walls cave in Nothing stands between us in the fire standing next to me there'll be another in the waters holding back the seas and should I ever need reminding how good you've been to me I got a joy come every battle cause I know that's where you be I got a joy come every
Cause I know that's where you'll be Gonna joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Gonna joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be
younger we started we went to church as a family and then as I was about 13 um, my family was really damaged from the church and we went away from it and at that point I was thrilled because as a 13 year old you're like yes I don't have to go to church anymore but um, God really amazingly came back when I was in college um, there was two girls in my freshman floor that invited me to a small group and at that point I definitely um, labeled myself as an atheist um, I was actually going, I graduated to be a middle school science teacher and these girls invited me and at that point I was really just trying to seek community in college. So I went, but I said, okay, I'm going to go, but I'm going to be arguing the whole time. And they're like, okay, that's fine. And you're like, please come. So I did that for a little bit and then I found a Baptist group on campus and it was fun because they like to play games on the weekends and to be honest, I did not believe anything that was that they were talking about on Tuesday nights, but I loved the songs, I thought it was fun, and they were really nice people. So I kept going back and I started building relationships with people in it. And then I went through a really hard breakup and I felt like everything that I knew that loved me just ripped away from me. So I was really trying to seek love in other ways. So I really dove myself into church and I started becoming jealous of my Christian friends because I saw that they had so much love in their life. Even if they weren't in a relationship, they were just seeking it from God. And I really wanted that. So I started meeting one-on-one. -on -one. I started going to church every Sunday, but deep down my science brain, or I was blaming it on my science brain, was keeping me away from believing. And it wasn't until um, my senior year I went on this retreat and I sat and I listened to this sermon about how science and religion can actually really work together. And there's so many facts that like actually really make it work. So I started praying, I started praying and it didn't take for me, it took for me to be traveling by myself to feel completely empty, completely lost. It was my first time doing a solo trip. I was in Paris actually. And I had a moment where I felt called to go into this one church. And at that church, I was sitting there by myself in my big winter coat, like so cold. And the song, Lord, I Need You came on, um, on my headphones. And everything just rushed over me. And I felt like I, I surrendered my life to God. And I'm getting goosebumps right now thinking about it. But um, at that moment, I realized that even though I might have doubts at times, and um, he's never gonna leave me and he's never gonna forsake me. And even if I can't see black and white answers for everything, like my faith is enough. So those couple months like kind of went fast and I, um, I got baptized on, in June 2018. And then a month later, I flew to, Viet, um, to Laos, uh, Vien Chen, Laos. So I moved there right after I graduated from college. And at that point, I was like, oh, this is so exciting. Like, I'm a new Christian. I'm moving to this new area. But then I realized, without doing my research, that it's illegal to be a Christian there. And then I felt so empty, so lost. And like, after I, I, I seek such a big community in my church back home after being saved, I was like, wow, I'm gonna lose it all. And I was always so nervous, always so scared that, um, that God's love was gonna leave me again and I, all my doubts were gonna come back. So remember like those first couple months was really terrifying. And I actually shared my um, message at my home church back home and after I shared it, this woman came up to me in the church and said 
that she knew um, missionaries that were living on the Thai-Lao border and she connected me with them. And then that couple connected me with another couple and that couple connected me to another couple that was in my town. And it was so amazing because it, it took one connection from a church that I didn't even, I didn't even know this woman. She came up to me out of nowhere from me sharing my story and four people connected me to this underground church that was in Vientiane. And through that underground church, my faith grew so strong. Like I was completely by myself. It was my first teaching job, my first time living away from my family from the United States. And with this small community, I really saw my faith shine so strong. But being in Vientiane, I was away from family and friends for 12 months. So I was like, okay, I need to come to Europe. And then the first thing I find out when I get to Prague is Prague is the biggest atheist or one of the biggest atheist countries. I was like, wow. So I moved from a place that Christianity is illegal to now a place that's full of atheists. Okay, this is really interesting that God keeps putting me in these places. So the first church I actually went to was ICP. And I remember going there and Alazar was playing worship music and I was like, wow, I remember being so touched during the worship and then during the sermon, like everything just seemed to line up. I love being in a intercultural setting because there's so many different backgrounds that people have come from. Like I was, I've only was a Christian for a few months, honestly, when I was in the United States, but it was all people that were very similar to me, very similar backgrounds. So I grew a lot because it was my, because I was just saved. But I grew, I have grown so much stronger when I have been in a setting where I hear people's opinions or not even opinions, but people, how God has moved in their life in, from Africa or from Asia. Like it's, it's amazing to see that God works in everyone's life, no matter where they're from, and how he's impacted them in similar ways that he has in my life, but also in a lot of different ways that I haven't even experienced yet, but possibly will in, in the future of my life. Ah 
powerful communion. I love and I was made by you. And I was made for you. Oh, and I. Since your love got a hold on me, since your love got a hold on me, I'm a new creation, I'm forever changed. Since your love got a hold on me, since your love got a hold on me, I'm a new creation, I'm forever changed. Since your love got a hold on me, since your love got a hold on me, I'm a new creation. I'm forever changed. Since your love got a hold on me, since your love got a hold on me, I'm a new creation. I'm forever changed. I was made. And I was made for you, oh, and I am unfulfilled without full communion. For millennia, philosophers have wrestled with the question, what is humanity? Where do we fit within the scope of the universe? In essence, we constantly are asking the question, who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? The world's answer to these questions seems to change continually. Are we what we do? 
Are we what others think of us? Are we our success or our failure? Are we measured by how well we do in the eyes of the world or of other people? How do we make sense out of life, especially when what we thought was normal has been turned upside down? God wants us to know who we truly are and all that we were made to experience, to do, and to relate to. In the opening verses of the Bible, we find the core answer to the question, who are we? God says that you and I were made in his image. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 puts it this way. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That truth holds the key to understanding ourselves, how we see others, and discovering our purpose and fulfilling our ultimate destiny. All that we are is caught up in God's image. But most of us have very little understanding of what that means. Over the next few weeks, we are going to explore what the significance of being created in God's image is and how it points to God's plan of restoration and ultimately to the purpose for our lives that brings us true meaning. When we understand the concept of what it means to be created in the image of God, the pieces of life's puzzle begin to come together. So, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? Who does God say that you are, that I am, that we are? God tells us that being made in His image reveals that we have been given three things that should impact everything about us. First of all, God has given us a distinct personhood. We are made for relationship. Secondly, God has given us a unique position. Every human has an intrinsic dignity and worth. Thirdly, God has given us an incredible purpose in life. God made you and I to have dominion over other parts of creation in a way that reflects His character, His attributes, His nature. Each of these tell us a glimpse of what God made us for. But in order to truly understand it, we need to dig deep into God's word and explore exactly who he reveals us to be as his image bearers. You see, we are to be mirrors of God's goodness. Being made in his image gives us a unique personhood, a unique relationship, and it gives us a position and a purpose that should define who we are and ultimately direct all that we do. Each of these distinct characteristics has been scarred by sin in a way that often leaves us empty. Jesus, however, came to restore his image in us and make us whole. When we come to him, he takes our brokenness and makes it new. In fact, Colossians 3 verse 10 talks about being new in Christ in this way. Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. That means we're no longer defined by our sin. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. We are renewed, restored to the likeness of Jesus Christ. But in order for that to happen, we must have a growing knowledge, a growing understanding of who Jesus is and what it means to reflect the image of God. So what does being created in the image of God really mean? Well, first of all, it, it means that every person, every person is made in God's image. The most degraded, sin-filled person still bears God's image and has dignity of the human personality. There is worth to human existence and sacredness to every person. That's the foundation for an orderly society and for civil law. Human life is from God, and God has commissioned humanity to protect its sanctity. We see that in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, and in Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. Therefore, it is by nature of the very fact that humanity is made in the image of God that murder is wrong. To murder someone is not just to kill them. It is to destroy the image of God in that person. So what is this image? 
since God does not have a body, in, in what sense are we created like him? Oftentimes when we think of being in someone's image, we think of how a child looks like a parent and we think of a physical resemblance. But God doesn't have a, a physical body. And so being made in his image is something that goes much beyond a, a physical dimension. Humanity reflects the infinite God on a limited way in the following areas. First of all, there's a personal likeness. Humanity, like God, is a personal being. This includes such factors of self-consciousness, self-determination, intelligence, emotion, freedom, rationality, a consciousness of the world around us. Inherent in this was the original use of language, able to speak and interpret and to understand, to communicate. Also, we have a moral likeness to God. God has given humanity an inner sense of right and wrong. It is an innate sense within us of what we ought to do. Even if no one tells us, there's something within us that points us in a direction of understanding there is right and there is wrong. This conscience is intended to prompt us to act in a way that reflects God's moral likeness. Also, there's a spiritual likeness in the image of God. We not only have a physical body, but we also have been given a spirit. When God created humanity, the creation of humanity was different. He spoke the rest of creation into being. But with humanity, he hand fashioned, he formed out of the earth, the human body, and then he breathed into Adam and Eve and all of humanity, a life-giving spirit. In fact, that's how Jesus, the second Adam, is described because he restores us to our original state of having a spirit within us that is alive, that had been uh, put to death by sin. It is in our spirit that is our primary link to God, our ability to fellowship with him, to relate to God spiritually in prayer, in praise, and in worship. Since God is spirit, our spirits reflect his likeness. Also, we have an intellectual likeness. Now, now technically, this is a subset of man's personal likeness to God. We have the ability to reason, to think logically, to learn in a way that sets us apart from the animal world. Only humans ponder the future, create literature, music, and art, make scientific and technological advances. Only humans truly reflect the image of God. Well, let's look at it a little deeper. Let's go to the scriptures and see what he says about us. First of all, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, over the livestock and over all the earth and every other creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Our understanding of being made in God's image has to begin with God and not with ourselves. God is one, and yet he exists in a loving relationship of three persons, the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And verse 26 shows us the dialogue between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit concerning us. Relationship requires more than one person. Love requires more than one person. God is completely unified in his character, his attributes, and his actions but God is also relational in his love and in his work and in his goodness. Humanity made in God's image is designed to reflect that relationship, the relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And God has given us a unique personhood. You are who you are, and you were made to live in a loving relationship with God and with others. God placed humanity into a threefold relationship as well. Much like there's a relationship that's threefold between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, there's a threefold relationship for us. First of all, we have a relationship between ourselves and God. Secondly, between ourselves and other people. And then between us and nature, what God else has created. Our value in God's eyes 
is not determined by what we can do above and beyond his design for us, but in the inherent nature of how we function in relationship to him, to others, and to the world he created. It is our relationships that truly bear the image of God. He goes on in verse 27 to say this, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Everyone reflects the image of God in their personhood. You are a unique being made for relationship with others. And the lives of others is not complete without you. Every person of every race, of every social status, of every background, male and female, is made in the image of God. Therefore, all have incredible value. And that brings us to the positional aspect of being made in the image of God. Not only is there a personhood aspect, there's a positional aspect to humanity. Let's look at Psalm 8 and examine it because it speaks directly to our position and the way God made us in the midst of all the rest of creation. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This powerful psalm begins and ends with a focus on the majesty of God. And that's where we need to begin. If we want to understand the image of God, we have to start not with ourselves, but with God. Now, in the middle, David, the writer, wrestles with the question of humanity and its role in the universe. But understand, we can't really answer that question apart from understanding the majesty and the glory of God. If we are in the likeness of God, a shadow of his nature, then the best way to understand ourselves and is to have a growing understanding of who God is and of his greatness. You will never understand who you really are apart from knowing the God who made you. The more you know about him, the better we can understand ourselves and relate to others as well. Verse 3 and 4, David says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, and the stars, which you've set in place, what is humanity that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? The writer asks two very important questions. First of all, he asks, what is humanity in light of the vastness of the universe? When we look at the cosmos and we see the smallness of who we are as human beings, he's wrestling with that question is, who are we? Secondly, is why does God care so much about us when in reality we are so small compared to the grandeur of creation, to the vastness of the universe? These are great questions. They're foundational. And philosophers have wrestled with these questions in different forms for thousands of years. The good news is God provides the answer. The answer he gives us here is our position in the universe. He says this, 
In verse five, yet you have made him, speaking of humanity, a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. Psalm 8 points us to our position. Humanity has a unique position in the universe. God created humanity as the intersection between the physical and the spiritual. Angels are spirit beings. They have no physical body, although they do at times appear in a physical form as they're revealing themselves, bringing a message from God to humanity. But they have no body in and of themselves. They are spirit beings. They're not physical beings. Animals, on the other hand, are physical beings, but they do not have a spiritual aspect. They have a soul with which they reflect personality, uh, but they are not made in God's image and they do not have an eternal spirit. They are different than humanity. And so the position that is pointed out here in the psalm is that we are lower than God and lower than the angelic beings, at least at this point, and it should point us to humility. We should recognize that we're accountable to God, that we're not the ones in charge of the universe. But also it points us to a dignity, to an understanding that we're not just animals. We are distinct from the rest of creation. There's a theological balance that must be maintained in order for us to have a proper view of humanity. We are made under God, but over the rest of his creation. And nearly every error in anthropology either lifts humanity up to be divine like God, or it pushes it down to be like animals. Pantheism and New Age religion, and, and even to a degree Mormonism, tells people they are gods. Conversely, naturalistic evolution says that we're simply animals. Therefore, we excuse so much of our behavior as simply following our animal instincts. Only seeing ourselves between God and animals can we have both the humility and dignity in the right balance. There alone, we're in the right place that God intended for us to have within his creation. It's interesting that the English word human derives its meaning from the same Latin root as the word humility, which means knowing our place. Psalm 8 explains our place in the universe and that we are to live a life of balance between humility and dignity. We are lower than the angels, higher than the animals, created uniquely by God to reflect his likeness in a way that nothing else in all creation does. Psalm 8 picks up on the Genesis account of being made in God's image in talking about humanity's role of stewardship over creation. We have a function, a responsibility that God entrusted to humanity to care for the world he created. And we're to do so in a way that reflects his nature, his heart, his attributes. Our position also reflects the worth that God has placed on humanity. Every human being has incredible value because they are made in the image of God. This is why as followers of Jesus, we are called to stand for the dignity of all people. Our world is scarred by sin, by the way people treat other people like property or like animals. Our history reflects the destruction that sin and rebellion brought against God's design that leads to racism, human trafficking, genocide, taking advantage of the poor, domestic abuse, rape, treating human beings as only tissue and not as a person, and many other sins. These are a result of someone or a group of individuals who treat humans as something less than being made in the image of God. Every human being, no matter where they're from, has dignity. No matter what their race, no matter what their background, no matter what sex they are, they have value and dignity. Not because of what they do or what they look like, but because they are made in the image of God. 
Prague is a beautiful city. And it's filled with wonderful architecture, beauty, and art. But it also has significant memorials of what results when the world forgets that humanity has been made in God's image and has intrinsic value for each and every person. Terezin is a concentration camp just outside of Prague, and it's a stark reminder of the horrors of the Holocaust. This set of statues right here where I'm standing is a memorial to the victims of communism. In it, the artist depicts how the oppressive regime robbed people of their dignity. For many, it took away their freedom. They were imprisoned for not adhering to the party line. Over 170,000 were forced into exile and became refugees from the Czech Republic during communism. Over 250,000 were arrested and imprisoned, and thousands died either in prison or by execution. You see, when we lose the perspective that all people are made in God's images, horrible atrocities can occur. And it can take place on any continent, amongst any people, honestly, within any governmental system. Because the issue is not an issue of the pattern of economics that they followed. It's a sin problem. As followers of Jesus, we are to stand against oppression and abuse. We are to be agents of dignity that declare the worth of all people, regardless of age, race, or gender. And not because of it is some form of political correctness, but because every person is made in the image of God. We stand for dignity because we believe every person has incredible value as image bearers. This is the mission of Jesus Christ. He came to rescue every person who would place their trust in him from their sin to restore within them the image that they had been created with, to bring them back into a relationship with God and to restore the fullness of their value, enabling them to reflect the image of God and to live in relationship with him. These statues here have a, a, a progression that reflects the loss of dignity. As you move further back, their form becomes more and more distorted. Their humanity becomes more and more deformed. These statues reflect what sin has done to humanity. But here's the good news. Jesus Christ, God the Son, stepped into this brokenness and took on sin. He who is perfect and sinless, who is the exact representation of the image of God, he took on our sin and defeated sin, the curse, and death. And he is restoring those who put their trust in him to reflect the image of God more and more. Now, if you look at these statues in reverse order, you'll see that they're becoming more human. Sin has deformed the image of God in us. But Jesus Christ came to restore his likeness in us through faith in him. Let me put it to you this way. Do you want to know God's will for your life? Do you know exactly what it is that God has planned and it has in store for you? So many people wrestle with questions like, God, what do you want me to do? Where should I live? What work should I do? What education should I pursue? Who should I marry? All these are good questions, but they're built on a false foundation of believing that God's will for our lives is what we do. And that's only partially true. We are not what we do. God's will for your life is not what you do. It is who you are and who you will become in Christ Jesus. Let me show you exactly what God's will for your life is according to the scripture. If you have your Bibles or on your phone, I want you to look this one up. Don't just listen. Take the time to look it up and, 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 and memorize it. Romans chapter 8, verses 27 through 29. Here's what it says. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So the first thing you see is that the Holy Spirit is at work interceding for us. He is praying for us before the Father. 
verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So here he's pointing us to the purpose for which God made us and the purpose that he has for our life. Verse 29, for those he foreknew, he also predestined. Now, sometimes people get distracted by that word, but I want you to read the rest of the sentence. He predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, or it could say many brothers and sisters. Now, what you notice in these verses here is that all three persons of the Trinity are involved. God the Father, the Holy Spirit who intercedes, and being conformed to the image of Jesus the Son. The passage tells us that the Holy Spirit is interceding for us right now according to the will of God. And what is that will? What has God created us for? Well, verse 29 answers it and says that we were created to, and we're designed to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. In other words, the work of the Holy Spirit in interceding and praying for us is to make us more and more like Jesus, to reflect his character and his nature. God's will for your life is for you to become more and more an image bearer of Jesus. We are made in the image of God to reflect the image of God through his son, Jesus Christ. God's will for your life is to reflect his image in a way that brings honor and glory to his name. The scripture tells us that Jesus is the exact representation of God's image in human form. We were created to bear his likeness. But sin has distorted that likeness. It's made us less human. Jesus has come to make us new and to restore the image of God's likeness within us, to reflect his character through us and make us more human, more of what God created us to be. Over the next few weeks, we're going to explore on a practical level what it means to re-image God, to reflect his character, his nature, and his attributes. Today, we briefly explored the personhood and positional aspects of being made in God's image. And it may have raised some questions. If it did, I want to encourage you to write to me, and I'll do my best to help point you to scriptures that will help expand your understanding of what this means. Next week, we're going to examine the purpose that God has in us reflecting his image. And that points us to the purpose he has for our life. But let me conclude with some truths that we'll, we will expand upon in the weeks ahead. First of all, the way to see ourselves is not to be defined by what we do or even by who we're related to, our background, our culture, our heritage. We are to see ourselves as an image bearer. You are a unique person created by God to reflect his image and share in his relationship. We are to reflect God's likeness in our character, in our attitudes, and in our actions. Secondly, we need to understand that sin has distorted God's image in you and me and has broken our relationship with God. And therefore, it's wounded our relationship with others and even our relationship with ourselves. But Jesus, he restores his image through giving us his identity and his life. He has made everyone who places their faith in him and in the work that he did on the cross, he makes them brand new. And he restores our relationship with God. And if we'll allow him, he will hear, heal our relationship with others as well. Lastly, our purpose, the design, the reason God made us is that he made us to show to others what he is like. Colossians 3 verse 9, as we looked at before, reminds us that this is the transformation that happens when we put our faith in Christ, that we are now to change the way we treat others, seeing that we have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. The more we look at Jesus, the more accurately we know and relate to him, and the more the likeness of God will be reflected through us. So, again, what does it look like to image God, to reflect who he is? 
people, it means that we look more and more like Jesus because he is the exact representation of God. Also, as we explored, imaging involves a humility, a dignity, a wonder, and a mystery. God has given us a unique place in his creation. Finally, we need to understand that we are to image God towards an audience. To God, we reflect his image as an expression of worship, of the worth that he has. To other believers, it is an expression of community. We need one another. We were made for relationship with each other. And to the world, we are to reflect God's image as a mission of love. So let me encourage you to join with me and pray and ask the Lord to help us all be renewed after the image of Jesus Christ, to come to know and follow him in such a way that what others see isn't a religion. They don't see um, the flaws and the distractions that the world says, but they see a reflection of God's character, of God's goodness, of God's holiness, of God's love in us that points them to him. This is what we were made for. And that is God's perfect will for your life and my life, that we reflect him accurately. God bless you. If you have questions, please feel free to write to me. I'll do my best to point you to scriptures and help you discover who God has created you to be. Have a great day.